Alan Ewing Merrill is going to talk about the emergent church as he experiences it. So I say God is good. You say all the time. God is good? All, all the, the time. time. All the time? God, God is good. good. Uh, my name is Alan Merrill. It's great to be with you. They gave us eight minutes, and I just want you to know that is so hard for pastors. Yeah. Give them a mic and say eight minutes. So I'm setting my stopwatch, and we'll see how well I do. Um, so I serve, my wife and I are co-pastors, and we serve a church in Portland, Maine called Hope Gateway. It's a United Methodist congregation, and we're about eight years old. It's kind of a hybrid of a, a redevelopment and a new church start. I want to say just a word about Emerging Church. Um, first of all, uh, Emerging Church is not new. Uh, the, in fact, those people who have been writing and speaking about Emerging Church have actually moved on from that phrase. They don't talk about that anymore. Uh, so it's just about right that churches, mainline Protestant churches in New England, are starting to think about that, right? That's kind of how it works. And the other thing I would say is that I don't believe in models. Uh, it would be great if there were church models and you could just learn what one church is doing and pick it up and plop it down and implement it in your own context and say, see, we've done it. But church, churches don't really work like that because church is always contextual. So I'm going to share a little bit about some of the things we've been doing in Portland. And uh, just a couple of caveats. Our church is not better than your church. Our church is not more successful than your church. We've made probably way more mistakes than you have. And we deal with as many challenges as you do, and some of them are around financial sustainability. But we have learned some things along the way, and I want to share my story just because um, as I share this story in different places, the feedback that I get is that it's an inspiring story that's helpful to other people. I believe more than anything that for God all things are possible. Amen? Amen? So that's what this is about. So Hope Gateway, this is Portland, Maine. How many have been to Portland? It's a beautiful city by the sea. It's a rising city. It's a foodie destination. Um, it's a beautiful place by the ocean, and we feel incredibly privileged to serve there. We had a really hard winter. <laughs> in fact, it, we still have some snow, but it's, it's gradually going. Um, and so it's a, it's a wonderful place to be in ministry. Um, we're clear about a few things. One of them is that our mission is, you know, taking our marching orders from Jesus and the prophet Micah. Our mission is to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. We kind of keep it simple. Have you seen this before? No. I would change that a little bit and I would say that um, this is where the ministry and the real mission happen is out of your comfort zone, okay? So if something is making you uncomfortable, that's probably where God is calling you to be, and that's probably what God is calling you to do. So our story starts here, actually. This is the Chestnut Street United Methodist Church, which I think Althea served at one time. Um, this building was built in 1856. The United the Methodist Movement goes back to uh, 1795 in Portland. Um, this building served well, this congregation, for... Uh, a couple hundred years, but over several generations, like many downtown churches, the congregation had experienced decline. It was pretty demoralizing. There was a sanctuary designed for a thousand. There were 44 rooms, a full-size gymnasium, apartments in the church building that the congregation rented. This was a cathedral-like building, okay? And at the end, there were about 20 people. So you do the math. 44 rooms, 20 people. Everybody got two rooms. It was perfect. <laughs> in 2006, the congregation made a bold decision to sell that building to a developer who really didn't care about the building, but he wanted to build this condo lot in what was their parking lot. And so he did that, and then uh, the, the church building changed hands a few times. This is what the sanctuary used to look like. It's hard to see there, but a beautiful pipe yeah. organ, balconies around three sides. Now it is a restaurant <laughs> called Grace. And if you have a chance to visit Portland, I strongly encourage you to visit Grace. It's a great restaurant. And you know what? For a few years, it was crumbling into the ground. The restaurant uh, folks put $2 million into renovating that space, which the church could never have done, right? Yeah. And now it is open to the community. It's a great gathering space. And uh, it's, it's a great community <coughs> asset at this point. Wow. So we've moved on. Um, in two, so for a couple of years, and just to say, my wife and I were appointed, as United Methodists are, to serve in Portland 18 months after they sold the building. Uh, there were about a dozen folks, most of them were in their 80s and 90s, and the conference said, make something happen in Portland, right? Perfect! Perfect. So this, these words from Shane Claiborne have been really inspiring to us. There is a movement bubbling up that goes beyond cynicism 
beyond cynicism and celebrates a new way of living, a generation that stops complaining about the church it sees and becomes the church it dreams of. And this little revolution is irresistible. It is a contagious revolution that dances, laughs, and loves. I highly commend that book to you, Shane Claiborne's The Irresistible Revolution. So one of the first things we did was we started a small group in our living room, in our, around our dining room table and in our living room, and we intentionally did not invite the 18 or the 13, 80, and 90 year olds. We invited other people that we were making connections with. This was our first Christmas, so about six months after we arrived, and we, um, this was the wild and crazy bunch that we had for a Christmas party in our parsonage. Um, a, a few months later, we began looking for a, a property, but a very different kind of space. Um, and, and this is a longer story that I can't cover in the time that I have. But we felt God calling us to this neighborhood. Parkside neighborhood is the most densely populated one-third of a square mile north of Boston. So there are about 5,000 people living in this uh, third of a square mile. And it's all that you can see, multi-family apartment buildings. We bought this little 2,800 square foot storefront space. It's on the ground floor of a parking garage. We had a worship space, a couple of kids' rooms we put in the kitchen, a little office. And, and still today, this is like a hub for ministry for us in downtown Portland. Um, a little less than two years ago, we added a second storefront site about 1.2 miles from there, not quite downtown, but in, with much better parking and about three times as much space because we'd outgrown that little 2,800 square foot uh, storefront facility. So as I said, we're clear about our mission statement to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God. And we've talked a lot about what those things mean and how we can embody that. We're clear about our core values. And I, I strongly encourage, if your church has not worked on core values, to do that. Because this makes all the difference in thinking about what your ministry and mission is going to be about. So community, inclusivity, creativity, simplicity, and transformation. And if you go on our website, you can read the descriptions we have for each of those values. But we live these out. And if you were to come to worship at Hope Gateway, you would, you would sense this. So this is a sign to hang to in our worship space. But you would feel these five values being embodied. We're also clear about our community practices, we call them. If you're United Methodist, these will be familiar to you. Prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. We talk a lot about that. This is a big four foot by three foot sign in our worship space. And every year we invite people to sign that with a, with a Sharpie. This is our alternative form of membership. We don't do a once and done membership. It's an annual thing. You recommit to the community practices if you want to be a part of the community. So here are some things we're doing. Block parties in Parkside neighborhood. So we go into the neighborhood. We partner with other neighborhood groups. We have face painting and bubbles and a bounce house and live music and a barbecue and all kinds of fun things with no strings attached just to love our neighborhood, right? We bake a lot of cookies and we bag them up in little bags and say, you are loved. Not God loves you, because that is a barrier to some folks. Just you are loved as a human being. And we deliver them door to door and just hang them on apartment doors. So people have this little message uh, that reminds them that the people at Hope Gateway uh, are a community of love. We do Christmas caroling and we give out free hot chocolate and candy canes with that same message. It's kind of our message, you are loved. We have lots of small groups that meet in different places. This one happens to be a Super Bowl party, uh, also in our living room. But it's a pretty diverse congregation. Um, he, this was on Super Bowl of Caring Sunday. You see, we brought in lots of food, and we helped our local food pantry. Um, this is my wife, by the way, my co-pastor and co-partner in life. We're really clear about um, spiritual practices, so labyrinths. Um, this was a Taze worship at Christmas time. And these are utilitarian spaces. This is storefront spaces. But do you see how we create sacred space out of it? Pretty intentionally. Um, weekly communion at both of our Sunday morning worship gatherings. Um, this is our fall retreat. We have 60 or 70 people that go every year away to different places. Uh, and, and just really coming together as a community and growing deeper in our faith. Um, this is a, an eight-year-old tradition now called the Great Easter Egg Challenge. And so every year on Easter, this was just taken, the two on the right happen to be my younger two daughters. And um, everybody gets an Easter egg with chocolate, because what's an Easter egg without chocolate? But also a challenge in there. And they relate to our community practices and our core values. This one was on the, the practice of service. Jesus demonstrated how to live in service to others by washing feet. So reflect on how you might wash the feet of others through acts of humble service in your everyday life. There's a deadline and every week during worship between Easter and Pentecost, people share a little bit about that. We're trying to make our community a place where children are fully included in everything.
every aspect of what it means to be spiritual community. Here's our little impromptu Christmas Eve, um, uh, Christmas pageant. And then um, intentional welcome of the LGBT community. We happen to have a, um, a space where the pride parade goes right by us. So instead of being in the parade, which many faith communities do, we stand on the sidewalk and greet every single person in the parade with the same message, you are loved and all of our rainbow stuff, and it is tons of fun. We just celebrated five years of community meals, so we have a free lunch every Tuesday and a free dinner every Thursday. It's a partnership, and we, we have served 35,000 meals in five years in the same space where we have worship, so that's kind of cool. It is really a place where love grows. Um, apple picking. Um, lately, we've been welcoming a lot of immigrants, uh, asylum seekers from Burundi, Rwanda, Congo, Angola, and minister, ministry with them, not to them, so they're, they're fully a part of our community and bringing the fullness of their own um, experience and culture to, to us. Um, I'm going to skip over a few things. One of the things we've done recently is to start, or two years ago, start a, a freestanding nonprofit with two areas of focus, immigrant support and recovery and wellness. So I'm going to just, again, tell you um, this quick story. This is Richard Berman, who's a real estate develop, developer and philanthropist. Do you remember, I, remember the story I told you about how we sold the, they sold the building to a real estate developer. Five years later, he came back to us and he said, I'm really concerned about homelessness. I'm concerned about immigrants who are homeless. And I see the impact you're having in the community. How about if I buy an apartment building and I will own it and you can operate it as housing for asylum seekers? Okay, so remember what Ben said? People don't give to church just because they're a church. They give because they see impact. He's a part of his own Episcopal church. He did not do this with his own church. He did it with Hope Gateway. So we opened Hope House, where we have 13 asylum seekers. This was our ribbon cutting with the mayor uh, speaking. And we're teaching them English. Um, this was our first graduate of Hope House, standing here in the middle with the rest of the Hope House residents. We have a little um, legal immigrant clinic with an attorney on staff who's providing representation to those who are applying for asylum. Uh, and then through addiction recovery stuff, yoga classes and meditation groups, drumming circles, and of course all the 12-step groups that you can imagine, uh, celebrating National Recovery Month with several big events, um, music, devotional singing gatherings. This was a fundraiser for, for Hope Act, which is our nonprofit. So raising money from beyond the, beyond the worshiping community, people from beyond the, the worshiping community who are supporting what we're doing because they're seeing the impact that we're having. Um, the last thing I want to mention, is a new program that we're really excited about called Growing With Hope. And so it's a year-long learning community that your church can be a part of. We invite churches to come three times during the course of a 12-month calendar year to um, study things like you know, getting to know your community, demographic study, uh, asset mapping, um, family systems, uh, adaptive leadership. And so we have six teams that have been in our first cohort group. They're finishing up uh, in two weeks and with homework and coaching in between each session, and they're coming together and sharing and learning and growing. Um, and so we'll have another cohort group. This is our first cohort group. We'll have another group that is starting in October, and you're welcome to apply and be a part of that group. We're excited to share that. I have some more slides that I'm going to skip because I'm out of time, um, but I'd be glad to sh answer questions or share more another time. Okay.
Australia. 